Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar on the important topic of palliative care. Our presenter this evening is Michelle Farnan. Michelle is the Palliative Care Clinical Program Coordinator at Penn State Hershey Medical Center. Previously, Michelle was the Clinical Program Coordinator for the Breast Center. She was also a breast cancer support group facilitator for seven years. Michelle's experience as an oncology nurse for the Breast Center and her work with patients in support groups at settings give her a wonderful foundation for coordinating the palliative care program and sharing her information. We are thrilled to have her here this evening to share her knowledge and to improve the quality of life through palliative care for patients. Please welcome Michelle Farnan. Michelle? Thank you, Pat. OK, thanks, everyone, for joining me tonight. Um, I am very passionate about this topic and thrilled to share it with you. So let's get right to it. Um, I'm going to cover and then make some connections between palliative care, survivorship, and quality of life. <clears throat> we'll talk about the differences between palliative care and hospice, as that is probably one of the most common questions I get asked along the way. Um, we'll show some relationships between survivorship guidelines and palliative care principles as well as the most obvious impact on palliative care um, in relation to quality of life. So this is one of my favorite slides because this is what um, we feel as palliative care clinicians many times, um, whether it's from other staff or more commonly from patients and families. And I think the problem is that there is not a good understanding of the specialty of palliative care. And because of that, we get the hands up, uh, I'd rather not talk about it, um, thanks but no thanks kind of uh, reception uh, when we bring up the subject. So what is palliative care anyway? Um, it's a specialized medical care, and it's for people with serious illness. And what we do is focus on the relief of symptoms and the stress associated with the illness at any point after a diagnosis. So it sounds simple, um, but yet it's very complex for some people when they have a history of, of thinking in terms of treatment and then hospice. So I'm going to try to clarify that for you. Our palliative care team is a, a multidisciplinary team. It's comprised of physicians and advanced practice clinicians. Uh, we have nurse, nurses and a social worker and a chaplain um, and a very robust group of volunteers that is very helpful in, in sitting with patients and families and working on, on programs that we do throughout the course of a year. Um, so there are strong relationships in addition with all of the complementary services that many uh, medical centers have these days in terms of music therapy and pet therapy and, and so forth. And so it's a, a full, well-rounded team, very different from your average specialist that might be involved in care. So now let's think about hospice. You know, most people think about hospice in terms of the end of life, of course. Um, it doesn't prolong life. It does not hasten death. It's very much focused on comfort. And the distinguishing factor with hospice, of course, is that you know, it becomes important when the treatments for cure um, are no longer uh, effective. So that leads us to the main difference. And, and this is the slide, I think, that tries to bring it home. Um, when you look at hospice, who qualifies for it, right? So traditionally, and under the Medicare benefit, it's anyone with a life expectancy of six months or less. And the goal is to achieve comfort. Now let's think about palliative care. Who qualifies for palliative care? Everyone with a serious illness and any of those other things. So you have a serious illness, you have uncontrolled symptoms, Maybe you have a really hard time uh, coping emotionally, or there's lots of family dynamics that make um, dealing with the treatments for your illness very difficult. Or perhaps you lay awake at night wondering about the next step in the disease process. 
Um, what comes next? How am I going to handle it? Um, can I continue to get treatments with all of these side effects that I'm experiencing? Um, the goal then for palliative care is to improve the symptoms and the quality of life during treatment. That's the biggest difference. There were, you know, years ago, uh, there was no palliative care. I can remember when I was a nurse on the oncology uh, inpatient unit back in the early 90s, and it was very difficult for people to kind of put the brakes on and change directions and say, okay, you know, I guess no more treatment, and I'm going to enroll in hospice to have that level of support. Um, now, with the advances in treatments, uh, people can continue treatments and, and live for quite a long time. Um, you know, in the midst of all of that, it's a chronic disease, and we need to find a way to better support people who choose to do that. Um, you know, hence palliative care. So this is it in a nutshell. All of hospice is palliative care, but not all palliative care is hospice. Hopefully that makes sense. So let's talk about breast cancer and make it very specific. When I think about the continuum of care um, and all of the diagnostic and treatment advances that have taken place in the last 10 plus years um, specific to breast cancer, you know, it's clear there are a lot of survivors and that is, you know, fantastic. And so people say, well, then why talk about palliative care? Um, we'll get to that. Lots of survivors are walking around with ongoing treatment for advanced disease or maybe symptoms that are bothersome and impacting their quality of life. Um, all of these new treatments you know, despite how wonderful it is that we have so many options, it does lead to uh, the need to have some very complex conversations and decisions. And that can be challenging on top of everything else going on, perhaps physically. The other thing in terms of breast cancer specifically, I think about how important it is to have very early discussions um, with physicians and other providers or family members and friends about what is most important to you. What are your values and goals and how might those things change as you get your next scan or you start a new treatment um, and things change in, in your life as you move on. Um, so with all of the changes we see, of course, it's important to think about not only guidelines for when um, do we see physicians for screening for breast cancer. We'll start at the beginning, might as well, right? Then we have guidelines for how to treat the different types of breast cancer that we know about. And of course, we also have guidelines for survivorship care, uh, which is you know, being revised every couple of years, most recently the American Cancer Society and the American Society of Clinical Oncology, you know, revised their recommendations in 2015. And what they do is come up with the, you know, the surveillance recommendations. You know, how often do you have to go for tests and when should we screen for other cancers? Uh, it addresses the assessment and management of physical and psychosocial effects of the disease itself as well as treatment. Of course, it talks about health promotion and significant impact of nutrition and exercise and all of those important things. And it addresses care coordination. So when I look at that list, I think about how does palliative care fit in? So side by side, it's an interesting phenomenon, I think. There are key components of survivorship guidelines that match palliative care. They each address physical symptoms, psychosocial disciplines, and they both incorporate the significance of care coordination and interdisciplinary care. So not all women, of course, with breast cancer need palliative care. But all women should be aware, I should say women and men, should be aware of the specialty of palliative care. 
so that if they have a time in the course of their survivorship that they are having a problem, whether it be with symptoms or decision making, they realize there is an extra layer of support out there that they can turn to in terms of a new provider, a specialist in palliative care, focused on symptom management, and true experts in communication. So let's think about, you know, when you think about what it means to survive, I think most people would agree that being happy and content um, with your quality of life on a day-to-day -day basis um, is surviving. And that would be regardless of where you are in the continuum of treatment for breast cancer. However, there is data out there, and I can say anecdotally from conversations I've had with many um, patients and families over the years, where those with metastatic breast cancer feel like maybe they aren't being addressed the same in the same way. In other words, it's difficult for women in a breast cancer support group um, at varying stages of diseases to sometimes relate to each other. So I thought this bridge study was very interesting. Um, it looked at a survey of over a thousand women in 13 different countries um, over the course of about a year, back in 2008. Um, and they, they asked a lot of questions related to needs assessment um, and attitudes of living with metastatic breast cancer. And in the United States, 64% of the women said that it gets too little attention. Interesting when we think about the number of women who actually are out there with metastatic breast cancer and living well with treatments, um, clearly as a chronic condition. The other interesting point relates more to communication in that 48% um, said friends and family are very uneasy about talking about metastatic disease. Makes sense. And then 90% of women, of course I like this statistic, say they're able to enjoy life despite having metastatic breast cancer. And that's very important. So clearly it's a reality for for many people, um, and you live with it for many years. So considering all of the research, all of the new therapies, um, it's important to recognize and make use, really, of all of the available resources. And that includes palliative care. And I think that at this point, many people are still, despite education, and I think we just need to do a better job of it as healthcare professionals, that Palliative care and hospice are very different. And palliative care specialists are experts in communication. They can help families think through goals, and they can maximize quality of life in the midst of everything else. So how do we know that palliative care is effective? It's tough because there are very limited studies out there right now, although that is changing. Um, some of the studies that we, we have seen um, include the TEML study from 2010. And what they did was they studied patients with non-small cell lung cancer. And some were assigned to early palliative care uh, with, you know, combined with standard oncology care. And those that had early intervention with palliative care specialists reported a better quality of life and really shocking to the oncology community was the fact that they also had a longer median survival than those patients with standard care alone. That's like the big, you know, flashing light, we better pay attention to this palliative care stuff. Um, there are other trials, and I, I have another slide that looks at it more broadly, but the ENABLE2 trial um, from Bakitas et al. in 2009 also showed a higher quality of life in patients um, with life-limiting cancer who received palliative intervention. Um, interesting. And then they also have a study um, a little bit earlier looking at uh, COPD and heart failure uh, with in-home palliative care, and they also reported a greater satisfaction. I think from, <clears throat> excuse me, from the healthcare perspective, there's a lot of information uh, out there right now about how palliative care can 
help reduce um, admissions and readmissions to the hospital, how all of the quality indicators can improve in terms of pain management and management of shortness of breath and those types of things. And there is actually, uh, pretty recently within the last few years, a Joint Commission Specialty Accreditation in Palliative Care, uh, which many organizations are, are currently working on, um, including this one. So although the studies are limited, um, I think it's interesting that they get so much attention when there is one that's finally published. And the one that I like to focus on um, is this ENABLE group. So ENABLE stands for Educate, Nurture, and Advise Before Life Ends. Uh, their studies span a, you know, a good portion of 10 plus years. And the most recent study, the third study, is <clears throat> was designed to investigate the effect, again, of early versus delayed palliative care. But what was different this time was that they studied both patients and family caregivers. So they, it indicated a survival advantage of 15% at one year for those who had early palliative care intervention. And it also showed significant effects and improvements on caregiver depression and quality of life for the caregivers um, for those patients who had early palliative care. Very interesting and very important to consider. You know, I always talk to uh, patients and families and remind people that you know, having cancer truly is a family affair. And it's very important to take as much care of the caregivers as we do of the patients, because it will benefit everyone to work together and get through the treatments one step at a time. So a lot of what I do as a palliative care nurse is, is spend time on the phone supporting caregivers and answering questions when patients may not know what to ask. Um, or not feel it well enough to want to get into a detailed conversation about what to expect. So it really is, uh, it's a partnership. I was thrilled to get the most recent issue of the Oncology Nursing Forum because the uh, driver and author of this study um, summarized everything very nicely in terms of the studies out there related to the impacts of palliative care. And it's fascinating that we still have some very important unanswered questions. And our team here talks about this quite frequently, actually. You know, how do we best identify which patients are going to benefit from palliative care? And you would think, well, the answer seems obvious. But we still have a lot of education out there related to exactly what it is in terms of uh, the public's understanding of it. So there's a website out there called getpalliativecare.org, and they use a very simple five-question quiz to determine uh, if palliative care is right for you. And the five questions go like this. Do you have a serious illness? Do you have symptoms that impact quality of life or your ability to be active? Are you experiencing difficulty with side effects that lead to frequent trips to the emergency room? Uh, do you need help with what to expect and the pros and cons of treatments? And are you struggling with coping uh, emotionally or spiritually or even having trouble talking with family about your disease? Well, I don't know. When I think about that list of five questions, I think there are a lot of people out there who might benefit from palliative care who are not seeking that specialty. And, you know, how are we going to best identify these people? Part of me says we need to just raise awareness and empower patients and families to ask questions. How do I get palliative care or who should I call? And I think that is huge, is just raising the awareness. Another important question is how do we include caregivers? So, as I said in my personal role, I spend a lot of time um, talking with caregivers and offering that support. It's critical. I think it's challenging um, for caregivers to get together. You know, sometimes you form relationships in, 
in waiting rooms and so forth, but it's often not enough, and we need to do a better job of including caregivers and supporting them um, in the process. And then, you know, the big overarching question is what is the best way to provide integrated, and I should say, and early palliative oncology care? Um, that, too, is a partnership. Uh, it's important to normalize the specialty of palliative care. In other words, oncologists are really good at managing symptoms. I mean, they order very, uh, you know, harsh treatments sometimes. And for many years, they have done a great job at managing all of the symptoms. But there are some complex, you know, disease patterns and treatments that might require a specialist. And I think it's important that the two specialties come together and create a seamless transition, or not necessarily transition even, but uh, collaboration in terms of managing the care of patients. It's another resource. The other thing that palliative care is exceptional at is communication. They're often trained specifically in, in communication skills. And some people um, don't necessarily want to open up about the what ifs of their treatment plan with their oncologist, you know, with the doctor that is treating them and working so hard to, you know, cure or minimize the burden of the disease itself. And so they hesitate to bring up those what ifs, um, treatment doesn't work. And it's fascinating when we see people in uh, palliative care, it becomes a different conversation uh, in terms of their values and goals. And in many cases, you know, they want to continue treatment at whatever it takes, um, but they also have the need to talk about uh, the future and decision making. Um, so it's another area where I think we could really do a better job of integrating uh, the specialist who uh, can communicate at a different level. And it might be a really good uh, dual effort um, to improve the overall satisfaction of patients and families. So I just, I can't talk about this, obviously, because it really, without mentioning quality of life and looking at all the domains, I mean, when you think about it, the primary focus, and perhaps rightly so in, in, in some way, um, during treatment, it is really on the physical aspects of quality of life. You know, we want to treat the disease, we want to make sure that people remain functional and get proper sleep and nutrition and and comfort and so forth throughout the, uh, the course. But the other domains are huge. Um, everybody knows it. Cancer itself impacts each one of them, and palliative care specialists consistently address all of them. Uh, it's just part of who we are as an interdisciplinary team. Um, so let's think about it like that. Let's think about survivorship and the intersection of survivorship with palliative care and quality of life. It makes sense. Like I said before, not everybody needs a palliative care specialist, but right now, current state, is that a lot of people aren't aware of it as a specialty and aren't aware of the benefits and probably don't realize that we might be able to improve their quality of life just by adding that added layer of support. So I want to give a little case study. <coughs> um, of course, we talked about when is the right time. I don't think there is an exact right time. I just think awareness and, you know, the earlier the better, whether you need ongoing intervention with the specialists or not. Um, is going to vary from person to person. But this is a great example of early integration of palliative care. So one of the very first um, patients I met was uh, a woman who was newly diagnosed with stage 4 breast cancer. And she had no idea she had the disease until she was admitted to the hospital for a fractured hip. 
Um, and in the, you know, in the workup, uh, they learned that the fractured hip was caused by bone metastasis from breast cancer. Of course, she had multiple complications along the way with debilitating pain. Um, she did require surgery, and she spent quite a long time in the hospital. Well, interestingly enough, um, the physicians treating her um, had a good working relationship with the palliative care program, and we were fortunate enough to have a consult um, on her only three days after her hospital admission. So she had only been in three days um, when we got involved. Um, it turned out you know, an amazing outcome. She, you know, went to a rehab and she was able to walk. She was able to continue her treatments for breast cancer um, and continues now um, in conjunction with monthly outpatient visits with a palliative care physician. So her pain was controlled. Her quality of life, um, it took time. You know, it was quite a road, but her quality of life, um, is good, as she puts it. She's smiling and happy and, you know, completed her advanced care planning, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and she's also enjoying, you know, a new puppy. She's going on trips. And day to day, things are good. And it's a wonderful collaboration between the oncologist and the palliative care physician. Uh, that's, that's ideal. We were involved very, very early and helped expedite the stay in the hospital and getting treatment going and, and sustaining that treatment. So as we like to say, it's a win. So the other thing I can't ignore when I'm talking about palliative care is advanced care planning. So palliative care is all about managing the burden of symptoms and about communication. And so is advanced care planning. And that's just another topic that kind of ranks right up there with palliative care that many people uh, avoid talking about. So what is advanced care planning? At the end of the day, despite what's listed there, you know, your very long advanced directive is many pages long in some cases, um, identifying a medical power of attorney. Um, it includes PULSE, the Pennsylvania Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. But at the end of the day, advanced care planning is really, it's about making your wishes known. It's about communicating uh, with family. It's about planning for the future and those what-if situations. And quite frankly, it's helpful to family caregivers. So as hard as it is to discuss some of these things, um, at the end of the day, it's helpful to everybody. Sort of takes the weight off. Um, and allows people to express what they're really thinking and feeling. So at a palliative care visit, um, mostly, you know, in the outpatient setting, obviously there has to be the right time and the right place. Uh, advanced care planning is usually not one conversation, but it's many conversations over the course of time um, as you build rapport. Uh, but this is something that we focus on, and people's decisions can change over time. And that's the importance of, uh, you know, continually communicating as things change in the course of treatment. So what is the big picture when you think about a survivorship continuum? We're talking about communication. We're talking about maximizing quality of life and advanced care planning. Those three things, those are all elements of an integrated oncology palliative care perspective. Um, we'd like to say that at some point it will be very commonplace, very acceptable for a palliative care specialist to be another member of the team that may or may not be needed um, all the time. But it's nice to know that people would be able to distinguish the difference between palliative care and hospice, except the fact that a specialist might be able to improve on some of these things across the continuum. And I think, and I say this with a little hesitation, because it's going to take a lot of education and conversation, um, I think we're moving in the right direction. In 2014, there was the first annual conference of palliative care in oncology symposium. 
And I was fortunate enough to attend that very first session in Boston. It was my first year with the palliative care team here. And I knew um, how significant it was to see a mix of experts, um, palliative care and oncologists, in the same room collaborating. Um, because over the course of years, it was very much uh, you know, the, the standard from the oncology perspective, you know, it's oncologist, oncologist versus hospice. And to come to the understanding that palliative care and oncology can work together to improve patient care and witness that um, was a very special time um, in my career. The other thing is that medical students and residents are both trained in palliative care. So they have a rotation. Um, is as an elective, and then, of course, it's integrated into their um, curriculum. So that's different as well. And we are also very lucky here. This is our first year having a fellow in palliative care. So when she leaves, she will be ready to take on the role of a primary palliative care specialist. And then finally, for nurses, which I think is fantastic and is also relatively new, is their CARES. Uh, requirement, which stands for competencies and recommendations for educating undergraduate nursing students. So there's a lot of focus now on educating nurses in the specialty of palliative care, which is really important because that, too, will help distinguish the difference um, between palliative care and hospice. So this is my vision. Um, nothing earth shattering, but I think that palliative care, quality of life, and survivorship is really all about a balance of hope and uncertainty. Um, we all know, you know, things come up that we don't expect in the course of treatment, and we are constantly dealing with uncertainty, and we all have hope, and sometimes what we hope for changes as we move along the continuum. And there's no reason that palliative care can't be um, part of the team to help create the balance which would ultimately improve quality of life. So I know that I have hit on a lot of different um, quick topics in hopes of generating some good questions that I can you know, truly meet the needs of those of you who are listening tonight. So please put your questions in. Um, I do have a list of websites that I wanted to leave on the screen while you submit questions and, and we can talk a little bit more. I'll just run through them. So the first website is the one I mentioned that has the great quiz on it about is palliative care you know, right for you. And that is the getpalliativecare.org website. It's a great site um, for the public to view and they have a wonderful video on there called um, Palliative Care is a Bridge, and it walks you through a, a definition of palliative care in terms of that added layer of support. Caringinfo.org um, is about advanced care planning. I really like that website because you can get state-specific um, advanced directives um, that you just print out. And in the state of Pennsylvania, they do not need to be um, notarized or done with an attorney. They just need to be witnessed. And all of those instructions are on that website. Um, planning for the future. Making your wishes known is another website um, that I think is important because it helps you think about what is happening in your life and make some decisions, again, in reference to advanced care planning. Of course, breastcancer.org has um, references to palliative care. and. Obviously, the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization and the Hospice and Palliative Nurses Association are good resources for um, healthcare professionals. So with that, I will stop. I'll leave that slide up, and I'm happy to answer questions. OK, our first question. Does insurance cover palliative care, or is that something that people must pay out of pocket for? Oh, we're very lucky. 
Um, years ago, um, with the birth of palliative care, it was not um, paid for by insurance, and a lot of specialists um, relied on fundraising to be able to get reimbursed for seeing patients. But right now, we bill um, insurance companies, all insurance companies, um, just as you would you would bill them for any other specialty um, office visit. So it is covered, thank goodness. All right, thank you. Um, can you speak to how those who are identified or qualified for palliative care, how they are identified? Uh, do you think nurses and physicians should be suggesting to a patient that they consider palliative care? Yes, so it's twofold. When I talk about palliative care, you know, here, I spend a lot of time educating nurses and providers on what palliative care can bring to the table in terms of how we might be able to impact um, patient care. So I do think, I encourage nurses that if they recognize uncontrolled symptoms or patients and families seem to have a lot of questions about those best next steps, and thinking through decision making that they consider asking the attending um, physicians to order palliative care. And we also are working on a screening tool for the inpatient side um, that will help raise awareness of unmet needs and hopefully encourage the treating doctors to order palliative care. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to identify who would benefit. It's ongoing education of both nurses and physicians and advanced practice clinicians um, of when is the best time and who are the best candidates. And because not everybody has a great understanding of that, I like to make patients aware of the specialty so that they might feel empowered to ask for it. Um, so I'm very happy when I get a phone call from a patient or a family member that says, we were reading an article about, can you tell me how to get an appointment? And, you know, two and a half years ago when I first started, that never happened. But I can tell you in the last six to nine months, I've had maybe um, a handful of phone calls um, for people who have just heard of palliative care and want to know more information. So anywhere I go, um, any little groups I'm speaking to, we try to educate um, just to empower people to ask the question. Thank you. Um, you mentioned cancer being a family affair. Are there activities involving families and not only patients when it comes to palliative care? So one of the things that I'm trying to get off the ground um, here is a support group for people with metastatic cancer. And we recognize the need that we have to, you know, separate that group from the other support groups that are offered. And what our goal would be is that people could come to the group with their caregivers. And at certain times, we could do breakout sessions where one of the facilitators would spend time with those in treatment, and the other facilitator could spend time with caregivers. And I'll be honest with you, it's been hard to get that group off the ground. Um, I think because you sort of get tired of making trips to the med center. That might be one issue. Um, I think there's a sense that you want to have life uh, be as routine, maybe normal, for lack of a better word, as possible. And adding one more thing um, might be too much. So that is the one activity that I can speak to. I do know that there are um, specific caregiver support groups offered at some cancer institutes. Uh, and I was trying to get some information regarding how well attended they are. And I did not get a response, which makes me you know, put a big question mark there. Are people resorting more to online types of support so they don't have to leave their loved one who might not be feeling well in order to come to a group. Uh, it's definitely an area that deserves more attention than what it's currently getting. And are there some outside of the box ways that we might be able to better support caregivers? Thank you. Um, another question, do you ever have anyone that is fortunate enough to be able to go from hospice to palliative care? Interesting question. You know, 
we have been fortunate enough, I should say, to discharge patients from our outpatient palliative care clinic. In other words, their, their symptoms have gotten to the point where they are very well controlled and their treatments are at a point where they're not creating um, a significant burden. So what we do is say, why don't we just touch base every six months? Um, I don't know of anyone, well, I should back up on that. In my last two and a half years, we had one patient who has sort of moved in and out of hospice. In other words, they went on the hospice benefit and their disease was not progressing to the point where insurance would continue covering hospice. So they did touch base um, with us. However, usually at that point, um, it requires more of a home palliative care intervention because the individual is, is no longer able to get out of the house and come to appointments. So it can work a couple different a couple different ways, but it is great when things stabilize and we don't have to see people every month because we don't want to be that added burdensome appointment either. Um, the other need to try to integrate better and have, you know, maybe multidisciplinary visits when you come to see your oncologist, that's another goal that we're working towards. So moving in and out of palliative care or being discharged from hospice and needing a different level of care is very individualized and we're lucky enough to have um, providers and home care agencies that can address people and, and make it very patient-centered. Thank you. Are there palliative care options that are outside of the hospital setting available? Yes. So if you're admitted to the hospital, it would be a consult to the palliative care team. However, we have um, outpatient clinics four days a week, and I know many palliative care um, services offer what, you know, clinics or doctor's appointments as an outpatient setting. So just like you would see your oncologist or make an appointment with your primary care physician, you could make an outpatient appointment with a palliative care specialist. And in some communities, uh, some of the home care agencies and actually some of the hospices have a palliative care um, home care track so that people who can't easily get to and from appointments um, could still benefit from the specialty. What does a typical palliative care plan look like for a woman with metastatic breast cancer? Love it. Great question. So the care plan would be very much focused on specifically what that woman shared at the time of her visit. So for example, someone with metastatic breast cancer to the bone who is having significant pain would sit down with the provider at a clinic visit and run through the history of all of the things that she has been going through, would talk about, um, I'll just use pain as that example, talk about the pain, what makes it worse, what makes it better, um, what kinds of activities would you like to be able to do that you're currently not able to do, what kinds of therapies have you tried for the pain, um, not just, you know, medications, although that obviously has to be uh, part of the list, but, you know, have you tried physical therapy? Have you tried, have you gotten any radiation therapy, you know, running through that list? And then coming up with a plan of what to try next. Um, of course, we would talk about how that's impacting day-to-day. Um, -day. Are you able to sleep at night? What have you tried to be able to sleep at night? Um, how has your appetite been affected? How is your family doing? And then once we get a very um, individualized assessment of the patient, we come up with the different areas that we might be able to, you know, have the biggest impact. And I think, you know, what's, what's um, refreshing is that an outpatient palliative care appointment, um, the very first appointment lasts at least an hour. And then the follow-up appointments are at least 30 to 45 minutes and sometimes longer, um, which tells you that there's a lot of conversation. Um, we do a lot of listening and then focus the interventions based very specifically on what we're hearing on that particular visit. Um, and then I'm lucky enough as the nurse coordinator to be able to take phone calls um, 
between visits in case we need to make changes. Um, it's very important in this specialty that we don't wait a month or longer if something that we are trying and recommending isn't working within the first week. So the care plan is, is individualized, it's very specific, it's very holistic, and it's very flexible. Typically how, often, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Typically, how often would a patient come in for an outpatient appointment for a palliative care? So basically, you know, they start with that first appointment, and typically, it's every month. Now, in some cases, you know, we just had a, just had a clinic this afternoon, and one of the doctors is going to see um, the person again next week. So that just tells you that the symptom burden is high and we're concerned that whatever treatments we're trying might need to be adjusted a little bit next week. But generally speaking, uh, the visits are once a month and um, sometimes several phone calls in between depending on what's going on. What would an estimated total cost be for short-term palliative care versus lo a long-term case? Wow. You know, as a nurse, I try to avoid the specific dollar amounts, um, especially now because insurance is covering it. So it's, it's paid for as a specialty doctor visit, which varies, um, you know, depending on exactly where you, where you live and what your insurance coverage is. So when I hear short-term palliative care versus long-term palliative care, you know, we meet the needs of the patients. If, if they have good insurance coverage and they're able to, you know, manage the co-pays, um, you know, it, it just it varies. And I'll be very honest with you, I try to leave the dollars out of it unless a patient tells me specifically that it's a financial burden and then we need to intervene and be a little creative with how we can, can balance um, financial burdens with everything else that's going on. And luckily we you know, call in the treatment teams of the social workers and the financial counselors to help if that becomes an issue. So there is financial assistance available if it is a burden for a patient? Yes. Um, I think that's all the questions we have for this evening. Hey, it's been great sharing the information and I hope it empowers all of you to continue asking questions and of course I'm happy if you think of things later to um, accept emails or phone calls. Mm -hmm. oh, we did receive Michelle. one question. Oh, good. Um, how long is the average patient in palliative care? Well, that's a good question because we would like to be able to see patients longer in order to develop a better rapport and have an effect earlier on in the, in the disease process. Uh, unfortunately, we get referrals very late sometimes because, you know, physicians still think that palliative care and hospice are the same thing. So we see patients um, very, uh, very late in, in their disease process. Right now, I think it's starting to change a little bit. I mean, typically, if we can see a patient um, on the outpatient basis for a good year, um, that's fantastic. For that. Okay. Michelle. Like all the questions. Okay. Yes. Michelle, thank you so very much. That was so helpful and so insightful. And I know that there are many of the people who are on this webinar who are dealing with this issue, uh, you know, in their families. And I think this will be really very, very helpful to them. And we will put um, an article in our pink link uh, directing people to our website so that even if they weren't here this evening, they can participate because I think it will be invaluable for families and the caregivers as well as the patients themselves. So again, thank you so very much. It was, it was exceptional and we're very grateful to you. Thank you for the opportunity, Pat. I, I really appreciate it. I do think it's so important. Thank you. Okay. And thank all of the participants and our staff, uh, Stacy Jones and Natalie Kopp, and uh, I think Michelle is on as well, 
who organized it from our end, and I'm very appreciative to, uh, to the three of you. Good night, everyone. Good night.